All right, so I guess I'm um, ready to get started. Um, anybody who attended my presentation yesterday knows that we are off to a terrific start uh, because the actual PowerPoint presentation has come up there, or the open office presentation. Yesterday I spent 10 minutes getting that done, so yes. <laughs> Yay to not fail. Um, okay, so I am, uh, my presentation is uh, Breaking Bluetooth by Being Bored. Uh, my name is Ronan. And this is DEF CON 2010 slash 18. So the title comes from the, um, I, uh, my research. I'm a graduate student. I'll talk about that in just a second. But the, uh, the title comes from, I, I feel like my best ideas, hacking wise, almost always come when I'm incredibly bored. So like math class is awesome. Long drives are great. Uh, uh, airplane rides. I, I actually developed one of these tools last year uh, on the flight to DEF CON. Um, because you know, what are you going to do in the air? So uh, I feel like, yeah, so that's the, uh, the reason behind the title. Uh, about me, I'm a graduate student at Virginia Tech. Um, my, my thesis is actually on Bluetooth security. So these are a couple tools I've developed um, while doing my research, um, but it's a much broader scope of things. And uh, my website where all this stuff is going to be posted is hackfromacave.com. I'm graduating soon, looking for a job. I had to do that plug. I'm sorry. Shameless plug. So if, if, this, if this goes well, which already started off well. Uh, see me afterward. Moving on to the important stuff. Bluetooth. I'm going to give just a, a brief over. I'm sure most people here know if you're in this talk because you're interested in Bluetooth. But Bluetooth is a, a short range technology. So Wi-Fi generates a lot of power. The Bluetooth is supposed to be um, basically they call it a cable replacement. Uh, it's low power, um, designed perfectly for smart uh, for like smartphones or PDAs. Um, it creates an ad hoc Pico net. So while most of us end up pairing just two devices, you can actually pair more than that in the little Pico net and have devices communicate with each other. But most of the time, you're pairing a headset to a single, uh, like a smartphone or something like that. But it can do more. And it's a very uh, highly growing technology. Um, the uh, Bluetooth website, and this was a couple of years ago, actually, I think 2006, posted that there are over uh, 1 billion Bluetooth devices. Um, in the world right now are Bluetooth en enabled devices. So that's a little, uh, a little bit of Bluetooth. Now we're going to the fun stuff. So part of um, how Bluetooth communicates is they have a Bluetooth profile. Um, you're probably very familiar with it through the access point side of things. Wi-Fi access points have a very similar style uh, where you have a device address, which is the MAC address. You have a device class in this case, which uh, describes um, what the device is. So it, it tells you if it's a phone or if it's a phone slash smartphone. It gives you a little bit of information about the device, and the device name can be anything you want it to be. Um, so cloning that information is doable, um, and this isn't something that I created. This has been you know, done years in the past. But uh, all you have to do is, you know, the, the first two, the class and the name, easy to do. Uh, the other one, the device address, you have to have some certain chipsets. The CSR chipsets are great. Um, you scan for a device, you get it, you can clone it. Um, and, uh, or you could change your profile. It's the same as like Mac spoofing. So if you ever do Mac spoofing, you do the same thing where you generate a new Bluetooth profile and now you've obf obfuscated um, who you are or what your device is. So the, uh, previously the method for doing this was just manual. I mean, um, so you'd have to scan for a device, so you have to manually change settings. So I'd created SpoofTooth as a way to automatically do a lot of these things and it does a, a little bit more. So it's great for obfuscation um, you, uh, or uh, impersonations. <laughs> you can actually pretend to be somebody else. Or uh, something I didn't really intend when I, I uh, wrote it was actually to uh, ob observe um, devices in range and actually log that. So I'm going to go through a couple of the different modes that SpoofTooth has right now. Um, the first one is a basic scan. So what it's doing is it's using the, uh, the dash I. The HCI0 is um, like a WLAN for everybody who's Linuxy and does IF config. This is H HCI config and it's got the same kind of thing. So that's the interface. Um, and it's scanning and dumping it to the log. So basically just scanning the local area and dumping everything to the log. Um, I should have mentioned this before. I forgot to. Bluetooth has two modes, uh, discoverable and non-discoverable mode. It will function in both. And this is, this is the key for the, the securing it. Um, you want to have it in non-discoverable mode. The only reason to have it in discoverable is for initial pairing. 
So you want the two devices to connect and once they know about each other, they have the information. They don't need to, you know, scan for each other after that. So then you turn the device into non-discoverable. So this only finds devices in uh, discoverable mode. It's not like if you might be familiar with the tool Red Fang um, if you're a big Bluetooth hacker, um, which tries to find devices that are in non-discoverable mode. This is only for discoverable mode devices. Uh, okay, so moving on to mode two. Mode two is actually just a randomly generated profile. So you really want to obfuscate and you don't want to actually have to think about anything. You just type the dash R flag and it creates you an entirely new profile for your device. Um, an Easter egg that I didn't actually put in the documentation, kind of on purpose, because I you know, wanted to release something at DEF CON. Uh, if you change from the dash lowercase r to dash uppercase r, I have a list of all kinds of uh, science fiction names instead of normal names. The, the previous one took the common most, uh, the, the top 100 first and last names and generates it from that. This will take, you know, your favorite science fiction characters, so you can be Yoda's phone or Malcolm Reynolds peripheral or Bender Bending Rodriguez's audio video device. So now you know. Uh, mode three. Um, I have to remember. Oh, this uh, this mode is where you actually get to specify the information you want to uh, change your device information to. So this is a little more of the manual side of things. So new name, uh, the device address, and the device class. Um, not all, you can't just put anything for the device class. I mean, you could and it will just say unknown. Um, so you, if you're going to put something in there, you know a little bit how, uh, how the device class works, which I'm not going to really go into too much today. Um, mode four is, oh, to load a uh, previously a logged scan. So if you want to scan, save for later, log it in, select, uh, make one of the selections and then clone that device later on, you can do that. And the last one is for, is the incognito mode. Um, you can have spoof tooth randomly generate a profile every X number of seconds. So if you don't want to be seen, <laughs> you can keep changing your profile. This will mess up persistent connections. So don't think you're going to be connected to something and keep changing that. Uh, it will mess it up. But if you're just running these scans or whatever, it will change your information. Um, uh, yeah, every, this one's set to 10 every 10 seconds. So this is what the interface looks like. Um, pretty straightforward. It will, uh, you run the scan, you specify the device, it pops up with this menu. It will list all the devices there. Um, I'm not that great with the interface programming so far. So instead of having nice little, it, it's uh, similar to how Kismet, the, the menu interface is for Kismet, except I know a lot less. So instead of having nice little arrows and stuff, I, you have to type in characters. So sorry about that. Maybe in a future version it will be a little more slicker interface. So uh, yeah, that's showing you uh, four of the scans. You can see there's a couple pages at the bottom. So you just uh, previous, next, and it'll show the rest of the scans, which I have obfuscated um, people's names and uh, the classes, or the, sorry, the address uh, in this slide. But we'll show you real quick a live demo of who's in this room. All right. Can you guys hear me clicking? Is that really loud out there? It sounds really loud here. Okay. This is actually, I don't know if it's going to pick up, it might pick up stuff up here. Because actually I'm not hooking it up to a long range device. So uh, Bluetooth has um, three different classes. Yeah, okay. Uh, popped up, done. Um, one thing to note, uh, so I, I'll go for the class first. Uh, the class of devices, there's three different ones, one meter, 10 meter, 100 meter. Those are somewhat accurate numbers. Um, so if you're looking to do anything with Bluetooth, you want to get a uh, class one because that's the longer range. So uh, Bluetooth scanning for this, uh, you see that the, um, uh, actually no, all these got their names. Sometimes uh, the, the scans, they have an initial scan and then a follow up. So you can see under, um, I think it's four, yeah, device four, it says unknown. What? Oh. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, that's gonna, is that a little better? I know it's all blur and it's hard to see. I mean, it's not, it's gonna mess up the menu if I do it any bigger, so sorry about that. Um, you can kind of see, it's mostly a blur, but uh, if you notice, is it gone now? It was, uh, number, uh, number four uh, changed, the name changed from unknown to red team. Man, I'm getting a lot of stuff in here. I figured there'd be more paranoid people. <laughs> 
it doesn't isn't picking up very far. Um, so uh, the device, the scanning for Bluetooth, uh, the initial scan s s detects the device based on the MAC address and then does a follow-up scan for the name. So some of the times, if you're you know if you're using this to do something like war driving, um, you will need to be in an area where you're actually going to have a persistent amount of time with the device that you're scanning. Um, you can if you want to capture that information because it it takes. 10 to 10 seconds to a minute to complete a scan. Um, the initial scan is actually very, very quick, but the follow up scan for the name takes a long time. So if you notice that things change on there or that, that you're not getting the name, that, that's the reason why. So. It's just this, all the, this only works with discoverable devices. Sorry, he asked if it was just uh, with discoverable devices. This is only works with discoverable devices. Um, through this, I've actually started a, a, another project called the Bluetooth Profiling Project. Um, I don't. It's similar to if anybody's familiar with Josh Wright, he's doing a, a very similar project um, and collecting a lot more information on the specific devices. I'm only looking at a little bit. Um, so what this uh, project is, it, it's trying to map um, the MAC address range of Bluetooth devices. So um, for those who aren't familiar. Uh, each type of device, every manufacturer um, gets their own. I thought I had in the slide. I forget exactly what it's called. But it's basically, it's the, the first six uh, characters in the MAC address are, um, are uh, manufacturer specific, and then the rest of them are you know randomly given to the devices. So if you can uh, figure out, so and and that range is the same on all devices of a particular type. So if you can get the range of those. By you know you keep scanning and you find that that whatever type of phone and uh, you see oh well there's a pattern here I see that all these types of phones have you know between this and this then you can use something else um, to uh, to uh, oh it'll help out with other projects actually I'll talk about that in just a minute so right now I've collected about 1,500 um, devices which it's it's is surprising it really is surprising how many devices are out there in discover mode because they really shouldn't be. Um, I listed about a thousand of them on my website right now. I'll try to get more. Um, yeah, so actually, I just went into a, this a little bit more than uh, on, the, on the previous slide. So, uh, yeah, using Red Fang, as I mentioned, uh, Red Fang uh, finds devices in non discoverable mode by attempting connections, essentially. Um, so, it has to run through the entire list and it takes forever. Like, you couldn't actually run the whole gambit. And I don't know what the number is. I don't want to quote it, but it's you know years and years and years and years. So this will help narrow that down. If a device, if only you know a thousand models of a certain device are made, and you can get that range, well then you have a lot higher than whatever the the MAC range, the possibility of MAC ranges is. Um, the other thing is to um, match the model uh, with the uh, the address. Um, yeah, we'll talk about a little more of the research. A uh, big part of it that I've discovered is actually the disclosure of sensitive information. Um, I feel like a, a lot of these, a lot of people don't realize what's being disclosed by the name of their uh, Bluetooth-enabled device. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so we went through this um, just a minute ago. Uh, the that's right, the OUI. That was the number I was looking for. Um, this, this is the sensitive one. So a lot of them are, are giving out things like the, the first name, um, the nickname, uh, location, device model. I've seen things like uh, URLs actually in the name because people name the computer the same name as its URL. So then you, uh, you can see it that way. Um, all kinds of stuff that you know, I'm sure they don't know that that's the name of it or that anybody walking by can just get that information. But uh, my findings are about 30% of Bluetooth devices that I scanned gave away an individual's first name, and that's you know that's just me scanning through them. I might not recognize a name off the bat, but uh, that's you know roughly it. Uh, about 20% give out last names, um, locations. Uh, the device model I considered that sensitive information only for um, exploitation purposes. So if you know what the device is, then you can target your attacks. So that uh, that's you know, but I understand naming it that way. I'm not saying don't name the device, whatever. But it is possibly sensitive information if people are going to try to exploit a particular device. If you change the name to something else, 
uh, other than, as I said, the MAC range, figuring it out that way, it makes it very difficult to determine what the device is right off the bat. Contributing. Um, I'd love to have an enormous list of, of profiles. The more that people contribute, the better, the better, and uh, the more accurate things will be. Um, the, there's a couple caveats to that. Uh, so I wanted the, the name, the address, and the class. No more or less. I don't care where you got it, I don't care how you got it. Um, just as long as you post those three things. Uh, I want to sanitize the information. Um, it is publicly available information, so there should be no problem with it. But um, just to, to be nice, uh, sanitizing things like the name, anything that looks like a name, replace it. Uh, the place information or other is for the category that if you're like, this is kind of, this might be sensitive. I wonder if I could ask him, just, just re replace it with other. I, it's not that important to have the, the name for everything, except for, as I said, the statistics earlier. That's most of the reason why I don't just replace the name right off the bat. It could help with uh, some other research um, down the road. So I've, uh, I've created a, a forum on my website uh, where people can just post the logs that they find. And um, I will uh, update the, the full list um, as I get more posts. So here's my nice little DEF CON list. Um, I thought this would bring the home, bring point the, the home, um, I phrased that completely wrong. Um, so this is just a couple of them. Uh, I've been scanning all of DEF CON. Congratulations, people do actually do hacking stuff at DEF CON. Uh, and if you thought you would turn off your Bluetooth device, I see some people in the audience right now, they're like, yeah, wait, I think my phone's Bluetooth is off, but, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how many collectors, I didn't get a list. Yeah, I'm going to go with about 250 different profiles that I found here. Um, and I wasn't even, this wasn't like an effort I made. I didn't try to get every room or go all around. It's mostly been sitting in the Hackers or Charity booth, booth. So if you, if you went to the vendor area, you probably, you know, got scanned there or walking around a little bit. So this is just a couple of them. Um, I, uh, I liked Fail Phone. Clever naming. Um, I removed the star, star, star is actually people's real names. Um, and you can see what devices uh, give those out. Uh, this is, yeah, as I said, just a couple. So, you know, be aware that whatever you name it, if you don't know what you've named it, it's probably giving something out. <laughs> I mean, if it, you know, if you rename it to, to uh, fail phone, then you're like, okay, well, obviously you took the effort and you know it's going to be named. If you don't know what it's named, you might want to check that out. Um, and uh, oh, I meant to say this, this list was uh, inspired by the, the Wall of Sheep guys. So I'm going to be posting some of this stuff with them later on. Um, so this is a short list. If you want to see that you were scanned, you might be able to check out the Wall of Sheep a little later. So that's the obfuscation side. That's, that's the, you know, data collection and everything like that. Um, now we'll get into the offensive side of things. Um, so a vCard. So this is one of the tools that I've been working on called vCard Blaster. Um, a V-card is a virtual business card, uh, essentially. You probably have used them before. A lot of places have them for, for download or information on people. Um, it works, syncs up with like Outlook. It, it creates the profile So if you for your contact list. Um, and it's heavily used in Bluetooth. A lot of the Bluetooth enabled phones will be able to share things over uh, V-cards, which makes things you know, a lot easier. Instead of all the business cards going around, you just sync up your devices, you know, send it over, and life is good. But some of them uh, that allow it, sometimes it'll come up with a prompt that says, you know, would you like to allow this V card? And you're like, oh, yeah, sure, I just met that guy. Or, uh, you know, we need to pair before you can send that over. Some of them, however, don't do that for this particular feature. Um, and I can understand why in the development of it they decided, you know, oh, well, obviously if you're just going to send a V card over, there's nothing bad about it. Uh, but there could be. Um, what V card a blaster does, is it allows you to send a constant stream of V cards to a particular uh, device or to all devices in range. Um, one, a couple of different things, let's see, yeah. Uh, a couple of different things this can do. Uh, one is potentially fill up the disk drive. Uh, v cards, while they can just contain email or your name or your phone number, they can actually contain a lot more than that, like images. So if you could send a constant stream of V cards uh, with you know, very large file types, you could potentially fill up the disk of something that's a very small PDA or a PDA with a very low amount of memory or if, if it's partition memory. Um, the other thing is you can add contacts to people's uh, devices. 
So that could be interesting uh, just to see what you want to add. The other thing is actually if you want to add a ton of random names in there, you've officially made it very hard for them to make a phone call because if the contact list had 100 people and now it's got 10,000 people in it, <laughs> they're never going to find mom. Mom, 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 where is it down there? And uh, I don't know of any quick way to remove new contacts most of the time. I'm pretty sure it's a manual process. So unless they have some sort of backup of, of their contact list, they have to go in and manu manually remove all of it. Um, something I'm going to be working on is actually uh, the random name generation. So that's not in there right now. But I'm going to be adding that so it will randomly generate a name. Um, you can't have the same name in the contact list. A lot of times they'll, they'll get angry about that. They'll say, are you sure you want to replace this? And you don't want to make the user aware that this attack is going on. So uh, I will have it so it randomly generates and doesn't double up on the names so you can fill it up that way and they look like legitimate ones. Because right now uh, I just have a random character of strings so they can pretty much tell that it's not legit. So this is what the attack looks like. Um, I can demo it. No, I don't have the demo one. Sorry, it's dead. My bad. But this is exactly what it would look like. Uh, so the flags up there. Uh, you, gosh, can you guys? Yeah, you can't really see it that well. So I'll describe what it is. Um, it has a dash G flag for generating. Um, a dash I twenty to say run it twenty times instead of ten thousand times. Um, uh, the, t the dash T, um, it's running, it has to do with the threading to see if it times out. A lot of these things will just continue to work so it will freeze up. So uh, you want to add a, a timeout option in there. And then uh, just the director, you can either select a specific vCard or vCard Blaster will generate one for you and then send that information on. So that's pretty much what's going on here. Um, I have a string that I gave it, big brother. And it's randomly generating text after that so that it won't prompt the user to replace the current contact. Uh, so this one, I, I wish I could show how quick it runs. And once that they initially you know, connect, it's you know, milliseconds to copy these over. So you can fill up a contact list pretty darn quick. Yeah, the live demo thing, not going to happen. Um, Blooper is actually a, a very similar um, type of program. It's exactly the same except for it's not vCards, it's any type of other file. So the process for sending these files is exactly the same. However, when it gets on the PDA side, they know that vCards are supposed to be interpreted this way and possibly other files are interpreted certain other ways and then the rest of them are like for download. So it's basically the same principle except um, Not, not to single you out or anything. I'll just, I'll just hold on here. Um, yes, yeah, so it's the same principle, as, but it has a different kind of denial of service. Uh, well, I guess it's the similar as the first one I mentioned. Um, what it does is I found on specific devices, um, actually this specific device, that uh, what happened is normally when you want to transfer a file, and some of you might have done this through Bluetooth before, you say you either need to make a connection, it says somebody wants to connect and then you connect and then it says, okay, now I want to transfer a file. Or it says, you know, Bob is transferring a file to you, do you accept? And when you click accept, it starts downloading it. Uh, I found on a particular device that what it actually did was it would cache the file and then prompt the user for the download. I don't know where it would cache because forensics on PDAs is very difficult and I haven't actually found how it caches it or where it caches it but it caches it nonetheless and that's before it prompts the user that the interaction is going on. Um, that's assuming a couple things like it allows anonymous connections. So this is, a, this is only one specific device that I've tested it on. It might work on a lot of others. I really just haven't had any funding to, to test a whole list of things and people don't like giving me their phones anymore for some reason. So, uh, so yeah, so what you can do is as I mentioned before, you can fill up a disk of a device with a, a low disk space um, and this one works a lot better because the vCard one, you know, you might have 20 lines of text you're sending. This one you can actually uh, generate, I think in the, yeah, uh, you can generate a file of whatever size you want and send that. Um, so you could send a specific file if you want, which is fine by me, but I thought I would just uh, offer to randomly generate a file because what's important here isn't the file, it's that it's causing uh, uh, it to fill up the disk space. So you can generate a file of, of 10 kilobytes or, you know, 5 gig if you really wanted to. Of course, 5 gig over Bluetooth would take forever and ever and ever. Bluetooth is not designed 
for heavy use. You know, you don't want to like, pass an ISO over Bluetooth. That generally will not go very well. Um, it's a very low data rate compared to um, Wi-Fi. It's two megabits slash three-ish megabits, um, and that's you know like theoretical max stuff. So, uh, so it does take a while. That's the one caveat of this thing of this attack is you really have to be next to somebody for a very very long time. It's not going. You're going to. This isn't going to be very effective at a coffee shop. You're going to have to. If you if you're going to performing this attack, it's got to be a device that's um, around for a, an extended period of time, hours, maybe a day, um, depending on how much disk space there is and if the attack is effective. Oh yeah, the I put the it can cause it to crash. So when I was testing this, um, once I accidentally hit OK or uh, so it. it, it I send a bunch of files at once. You can send one file or a lot of files. However, you know, if you want to test it with the device to see what's more effective. So I started, you know, caching the files and then it says, you know, do you want to reject them? Do you want to say okay for this file or do you want to download them all? And I just happened to actually I accidentally click uh, accept all. And so uh, long story short, it took what was in this memory, which was almost full, and it tried to write it over into the real file system. So we completely ran out of disk space. Um, and I don't know if it ran into the memory because a lot of these devices actually, you know, their hard drive space and their RAM are actually, you know, the same actual physical chip or chip uh, uh, flash or something like that. So what happened is it actually completely uh, fried the device and I had to do a factory reset, which was fun. It took me forever to figure out, you know, what was going on and it, it died. And then bringing it back up, it would not boot. It would not boot. So I actually had to do the manual like factory reset to get that to work. So that's a nice little attack when you completely brick the system um, and has to do a total factory reset. So this is what it looks like. Um, I, um, I can attempt the demo over here. Uh, yeah, actually, I'll do the demo and then come back to see what this looks like. So, to scan for a Bluetooth device in uh, Linux, HCI tool, scan, you could use Spooftooth. This is just uh, quick um, and easy. So Spooftooth, uh, the advantage over, over just running like a script that will do this is that Spooftooth only logs it once. So if you're doing a <laughs> ‑‑ thank you. Thank you whoever out there. Uh, it's hard to see. It says Ronan's mum. <laughs> Fanboy, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm sure people have been pounding on this thing because it's a Bluetooth lock and I enabled Bluetooth on this. Um, so we're going to try to run this. Let's see. Uh, against this file. So, uh, sorry, let's see if I can boost this up a little bit. That didn't do anything. It's a little better. One more. Yeah, okay. So that's the command I'm going to run against my Dell Axum up here. And should have just copied and pasted that like I just did. It would have been faster. No. Ah. Uh, oh, <laughs> I should. Uh, I I need. I'm actually trying to upload a file that doesn't exist. Evil file. Wait. Oh, that's not good. Okay, well that didn't work at all. <laughs> um, I don't know. Oh, and I know why the. Uh, haven't updated this system. I apologize for that. Um, but the attack would have looked exactly like this. So that's actually the system's fault. The program should work fine. Uh, I guess I should mention that a lot of these are actually generating a script internally. So that's why actually that failed is I didn't include some of the code. I actually just end up bundling into a script. The new versions that I'm working on right now will have everything in it so you don't have to install um, some of these tools, some of these additional packages, and that's the reason that failed right now. But anyway, uh, so what I have here that's hard to see is um, it's going through 500 iterations and it's uh, using a file um, that I'm generating of size uh, 10,000. And you can select the file name, the current file name, 
and you can oh wait oh yeah and then you can tell it what the file name should be on the other end so it doesn't have to be the same so you just have to say that this is some sort of uh, whatever file maybe someone would accept it actually or something that looks nonchalant uh, and then target the device and you can kind of see the, the iterations it's like five lines each of it finds the device it's sending the file and then it's done um, but it does take quite a while for a size this this probably took 10 minutes to send the size of a 10,000k so yeah it, it will take a little bit of time and then on the other end you can kind of see it has a little pop up uh, that pop up um, you can either so save all in the bottom right left that's what I clicked and that was the, the downfall of the device um, so this pops up there and um, I imagine a user would probably notice if I send a file that says evil file so uh, it actually it generates a counter too you have that option so the files can look differently and that's just how I knew how many were up there if you're testing it makes it a lot easier because uh, another it's sort of denial of service in this and this kind of falls into both of them uh, pop up menu denial of service uh, if you're sending a constant stream of files that are very small this is another option and they click no it pop right back up you click no it pops right back up so unless they get away from you they can't actually disable Bluetooth unless there's some hardware setting because they can't get the start menu because they click start menu and that pop up uh, is you know uh, a higher priority than the start menu. So all you do, and this happened to me, and I was like, no, stop, no, crap, I gotta go over the other side, because because it kept popping up, and I couldn't actually do anything on the device because of the pop-up menus. So I'm sure there's all kinds of other things that could utilize that sort of an attack, but uh, that did happen. And uh, so if you really want to just annoy somebody, that's that's a good way to do it. Um, another tool I've been working on is a uh, pwn tooth. This is an uh, attack suite essentially. Um, I've tried to bundle together uh, some Bluetooth, some common Bluetooth attacks. Um, other than the ones I mentioned here, none of these are mine. But I figured I, I'd make a, a little bit of an easier way for certain people to, to do pen testing. Um, there's a really good uh, actual uh, suite uh, in Backtrack uh, that's, that's, you know, if you're a first time user, you, you want to go that route. Um, it's, it's a very, it steps you through things. Mine does not do a step through. Um, what this is, is it basically allows you to run a script and it will scan for everything and only run the attacks once against it. So it, it, it's a binary file but it could have been a script file. Um, but it only runs the attack list once. You provide the list of attacks you want to launch um, through the tools. So I'm, I'm not, there's no point in click or anything or you're not just selection. You make this config file whatever you want. Um, and you know you run those attacks against the devices. You can say one specific device. You can say all devices in range, and it'll run all of those against it at a time. Uh, I don't do any report generation. I probably won't do any report gener generation. Maybe, possibly, but so all you get is the uh, the output of the actual attack. It's not going to tell you. I'm not going to provide. Our opponent is not going to provide the information that says uh, this succeeded, this failed, whatever. Um, but it's mostly there to make. I, I worked on a project where I had to run a lot of attacks. Excuse me. I had to run uh, attacks a lot of times against a device, and, and then in, I have to type in the Mac every time, and it got to be a little bit of a pain. So this is more just the, the automatic way to do things. Um, yeah. So here's the config file. Um, the configuration file uses a, a star as a wildcard, and that's where it inserts the MAC address. So a lot of them will tell you this is where you know the MAC address should be when you're running the command. That's basically all it really does. Other than it could just be a bash script, except for that it scans and only runs it once. Um, this is the, the default area where the, the file is installed, and uh, it will. Um, you can you can run it uh, multiple times through. So you can say, I want to actually run this script as many times as you want, and it'll do the attacks for you. And uh, that's just an example of uh, the specific log file that you want to log the information out to, and um, just scanning it ten times. So you can specify a different configuration file if you want, but. This just makes your life uh, a little bit easier if you're going to be running uh, lots of attacks against a single device or in an area of devices. If you're going to be pen testing at your business, business and you want to see what vulnerabilities are out there and you're walking around with it, this might help you out a little bit. An example. Um, so pound is to uh, keep it from being read in. So uh, the list comes with the examples. Um, it's got some default ones. And uh, I tried to put some in there, some of the commands, because I know some of these tools, while awesome, are not 
as you know widely used, so there's not a whole lot of documentation and examples of things. So I tried to include examples of how to use them um, in a way that I would normally use them. So that should help you out if you're if you are new to this um, in a in getting started. So I provided a couple examples. You can add whatever you want. Bluetooth related. Use, as long as you use the wildcard, it'll insert the address in there and you know run whatever you want. Um, here's a couple of project pages for the different things, and I'm up for Q and A. So, anybody? Yeah, I, it's something I started years ago. I just decided to put it up there, and then like ever since, every presentation I do has a bunny. So, uh, yeah. Uh, we have any questions? Does anybody th what time? Do you know what time it is? Not good. Any questions? Nobody cares. All right. Um, the problem with the f you have to find it when it's non-discoverable, and that's a big pain. Um, there is actually uh, uh, some presentations. I think they did a presentation last year at DEF CON and then at ShmooCon um, using a uh, USSRP to monitor the bandwidth. The, sorry, monitor the um, the frequencies and you know getting it that way. But that's frequency analysis. So you can discover devices there, and you might be able to pull out the Mac, and it's very complicated and long. Um, but uh, Red Fang is a great option to finding non-discoverable devices. But it it takes so long, it's not terribly practical. Uh, yeah, actually we've got some uh, Hackers for Charity free swag here. If anybody wants it, you can come on up and throw some too. Will people want this stuff? All right, I'm going to see how far I can get out. Ah, almost to the back. Deflected. All right, I'm going to be in, uh, in room 114. If you have questions about that or maybe about this. <laughs>